Today we find out what's made the Mercedes-Benz GLE more appealing than before. Kia Sonnet gets its first midlife facelift and we pit the Hero Extreme 160R 4V against the Yamaha FZS version 4.0. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Soini that The GLE is Mercedes-Benz's top-selling model in India and it's not hard to see why. This SUV is still as classy and luxurious as you can expect from a Mercedes-Benz. But this SUV packs in the desirability quotient as well as practicality that you would expect from a larger SUV. Let's take a look. As for the changes, most easily noticeable are the new headlamps with the new slatted DRL light signatures that bring the GLE in line with the likes of the GLC. The grille too has been updated into a simplified single bar design but draws more attention than before with the neat star theme detailing. More presence comes from the AMG themed bumpers. The contrasting slatted look and the fuller elements here add a fair dose of aggression to the otherwise quite tempered look of the GLE. The AMG theme continues with the new 20 inch wheels. They look sharp but some might find them a touch too aggressive for the smooth rounded shape of the GLE. But otherwise the signature GLE silhouette of the glass hull with the inverted C pillar still gives this SUV a good degree of individuality. The footboards add a dash of toughness but could have been a touch more functional in the execution. A minor redesign of the tail lamp surrounds off the changes. The horizontal lighting now matches the front and gives the GLE a wider stance at night. Now step inside the new GLE and you'll see that you have that very rich, luxurious feeling immediately as you step in. And that comes right with the layout of the dash to begin with. For example, the way this dual screen is just fitted onto this cowl with these ridges really gives you that sense of purpose but still a very luxurious almost business lounge like feeling and that sense continues in the lower half also with this wood paneling and these four metallic air vents over here and also taking this a step further is the general layout of this instrumentation now this is older it's not what you get in say the newest glc or s class and again that's no bad thing because what you do get are these very nice to use very hefty very tactile buttons for the climate controls and that continues over here too. You get this touchpad as well as all these hard buttons to control everything that's happening in the screen. And to be honest, that works really well. The textures and finishes drive home this point further. The wood paneling is done well, especially the sliding cover for the central cubbies. The texture here feels lavish, as does the general quality of the chrome materials and soft surfaces. In keeping with this theme is the ambient lighting that Mercedes does so well in its cars these days. The new screen interfaces fit in naturally into the GLE's existing package. The instrumentation with its themed layout is quite easy to read and displays most information legibly. The touchscreen is easy to navigate as well with its large icons and intuitive sub menu. In fact, with the physical redundancies of this older setup like the hard buttons for the main menus and the touchpad in the center, we think this is one of the easier infotainment setups to get your head around in this segment despite the relatively smaller screen sizes. So Mercedes has decided to keep this a two-row SUV in India. What that means for you is a massive amount of space. Seat is set slightly forward to my driving position, but what you do get is an immense amount of foot and knee room and leg room. There's a lot of space for everything here. And again, that generally great ambience from the front is repeated here. So you have all the nice materials, all the nice textures here. But what takes this further is this function. You had a reclining function for the seat back and again the seats themselves are really quite comfortable they hold you in place they have a nice contouring and these really soft head pillows they really cocoon you really well both the passengers can also control the sunroof right from here aside from this you have these ac vents over here four zone climate control so separate controls right here again tactile controls and a slightly odd cup holder arrangement here. Now this new GLE also comes with the comfort package as standard now with this update. What that means is, aside from everything that I just showed you, you get this really quite extravagant center console and the way it folds out, it's a really great space, you know, in terms of how usable it is. So you have a phone holder here, another tray over here, and a deep pocket here with two chargers. But with so much focus on these two seats, the middle passenger will suffer a bit. 
So as you can see, this tunnel is quite protruding. There's quite a bit of a hump. And because of how contoured these two seats are, this center seat and with this armrest, it's not a very comfortable place if you want to travel three abreast. There's great practicality on offer with numerous charge ports, large door pockets, and the powered rear seat makes it very easy to carve out a generous amount of boot space. This ties in with an especially long list of features that includes wireless Android Auto Apple CarPlay, seat kinetics and mood settings, a perfume dispenser, heated and cooled front seats, wireless charging, heated and cooled cup holders, and a 13-speaker Burmester audio system. There's a fair degree of safety features too, like 360-degree cameras, hill descent control, and off-road mode with the transparent bonnet view, and some degree of ADAS features. Although, like before, the emergency braking function remains too reactive to be a good aid in Indian traffic. Also new with this update is this steering wheel. It's again taken from, say, something like a GLC. And like we've said before, it's not our favorite. It's nice to hold, but these capacitive panels, they do take some time to get used to. And sometimes simple tasks also take a few more taps and swipes than necessary. And then, of course, when it does get smudgy, it's somewhat compounded further. But coming back to what's good, the seats, they're just like the back seat, they're very comfortable, very supportive. You have a good deal of adjustment, maybe not the best in the segment, but you have these powered thigh supports, so those help and heated and cool function. A 9-speed gearbox pairs with this along with all-wheel drive. On the move, especially if you keep things steady, it's a pleasant experience. There's a pleasing growl from the engine as you feed it more revs, but not much else in the way of noise. So the GLE will amble along that smooth, unruffled Mercedes way in moving traffic or on the highway. The tech makes for a clean, progressive supply of performance and in this kind of driving, the gearbox too is unintrusive. But we would have liked for the GLC to have worked a touch better just off idle, even with how impressively quiet it is here. There's no sport mode, which also means that the gearbox can sometimes be caught out during quick path throttle overtakes, where it needs a couple of seconds to choose the right gear. There's a surprising gush of performance once you start to work your way around this. In the higher reaches of the rev band, the engine and gearbox become notably more aggressive, as the 0 to 100 kmph time of 6.1 seconds suggests. The gearbox is more confident in its responses and the engine is far more responsive too. Now the ride and handling character of the GLE is again focused on adding to the cabin's comfort. But that being said, this air suspension setup at lower speeds, we would have liked for it to have worked a bit better. So, while at higher speeds, it's great, it smoothens out the road surface and so on and so forth. At lower speeds, over our patch surfaces, the kind that you find everywhere in India, and potholes, you do notice it a bit more than ideal in the cabin, say something like this, and there are a few distant sounds as well. But that being said, the steering is light. It's maybe not as precise or as smooth as in an E-Class, but that's maybe asking too much. But in regular conditions, especially in traffic, it's very easy to thread the GLC around because you don't really feel the weight of the car with how the steering is. But once you've picked up space, again, you'll realize that the GLE likes to take things steady. It's not one to be hustled, which is where it's fine. It'll take corners calmly, it will lean into them progressively, but when you start pushing a bit harder, you do notice that maybe it could have done with a bit more composure, but that's not this car's beef at all. It doesn't even have a sport mode. Priced at Rs 1.37 crore for the GLE 450 formatic version, this SUV demands a slight premium over rivals. We would have liked a smoother drivetrain at this price, but most buyers of the GLE will probably not be too concerned with that. They might want better low-speed manners, but with the long features list, the inviting cabin and host of features, the GLE seems to have its top spot covered. Do drop in a comment on our YouTube channel and let us know whether you would want to put your money on this updated Mercedes-Benz GLE. We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll get you acquainted with the facelifted Kia Sonnet. watching Overdrive. Kia Sonnet has been given its very first midlife makeover. Here's to in with all the details from the launch floor. Now it's almost become difficult to keep track of just how many compact SUVs you can buy in India right now. 
But the Kia Sonnet, it always stands out with how feature-packed and premium feeling it's always been. So let's just look around this new one to see if that's remained exactly how it was. Now the thing that you notice at first when you look at the new Sonnet is this new lighting. It's very similar to what you saw on the Celtas with this big huge L-shaped signature. And that's been carried over here as well. It's still full LED. And like on the Celtas, you have the tech line, the GT line and the X line. This is the X line. So you have a different bumper with the black anodized grills and this new fog lamp. Now you have four new alloy wheel designs to choose from depending on the version that you buy. Now this X-Line comes with these really quite sharp looking dual tone alloys. And again, they change with the variant that you pick. The bumper too has changed slightly. Now in this X-Line variant, you have these black inserts like from the front. And again, depending on the variant that you choose, say the tech line will have a slightly milder looking bumper, but that has also changed. Now the overall layout of the dashboard hasn't changed all that much. So you have that still very high quality feel coming from it, especially with these steering wheels and the metallic paddles, the stitching on it, and all the switch gear that's here, especially these vertical air vents. So they all feel really quite nice. But what has changed is this upholstery. Now this being the X-Line version, you have get this slightly dark greenish theme to it. And there are about three or four more options, again, depending on the version that you pick. Now, like I just said, the Sonnet was especially well equipped and that continues with this facelift to an even greater standard. Now you have a fully digital instrument cluster. It's quite the step up from that LCD display that you had earlier and it's shared with the Celtas. So it's very high quality. The graphics are really slick. So it's now very easy to see the information that the car wants to show you. Now another small touch which will help you is four-way adjustable seating. So the you can choose this angle. You can't choose the height automatically, but you can sort of put it forward and back like this and also recline it now electronically. Now, among other changes, all the windows, not just the driver, gets this one-touch up and down feature, which we think is great. And then continuing on from the older Celtos, you still have ventilated seats, you still have drive and traction modes, a 360-degree camera, cameras of great quality. But another feature addition here is that when you use the Find My Car application on your phone, you can access these cars used directly on your phone, which is, I think, a very interesting feature. And again, you have ambient lighting and climate control being some of the more bigger highlights. Now, in terms of safety, you also get ADAS now, level one ADAS in the top variants, but all Celtos and all Kia cars now get six airbags as standard. Now, you'll see another feature that's been carried over the air purifier again the same as what it was before but again over here you see the new upholstery and so on the sunroof another good feature to have and the sonnet also continues with these sunshades now they're a great touch considering most SUVs at this price point don't get it in terms of space things haven't exactly changed so it's exactly how it was before so you have a reasonable amount of space it's not the best in this segment by any stretch but it's reasonable say for a family of four but and for an occasional Fifth passenger, the central tunnel isn't quite high, so that's not a problem either. You have the sunroof and fairly large windows, so it feels like a fairly spacious cabin too. Now the Sonnet hasn't exactly changed mechanically, so all the engine options continue as they were. Now this being the top end option, a one liter turbo petrol, which you can have with a DCT or an IMT. Luckily the diesel version hasn't been let go of with this update, you still get that and in fact you can now have this with the manual, again, the diesel version. And of course, the base engine remains at 1.2 litre naturally aspirated petrol. You can expect it to be launched by about, say, mid-January. But what do you think of it? Do you think all the new features make it even more desirable than it was already, especially the, all the tech features inside? And for prices, we think it'll start at about 10 lakh rupees and go up to about 16 to 17 lakh rupees for the diesel version. After this short break, it's a battle of the 160cc motorcycles from Hero and Yamaha. Stay tuned, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Now, the Hero Extreme 160R 4V and the Yamaha FZS version 4.0 are motorcycles that have been in the country for over a decade and we decided to bring the latest iteration of these motorcycles just to find out how relevant they are in today's day and age. So 
not only change, but it's also evolution that has become a necessity in today's world if you want to stay relevant. And especially if you're a motorcycle manufacturer that caters to the 160cc motorcycle segment. And you have two products that have been around for more than a decade. Now, to my left is the Yamaha FZS version 4. And on my right is the Hero XT 160, a four valve. Now, both these motorcycles are not in direct competition with each other fairly, so they're similarly priced. But we are here to find out today which one brings what to the table and which one suits you best. So, let's get right to it. In the looks department, both these motorcycles look a lot beefier than ever before, with the 160R coming across as the more performance focused machine, which it actually is. It was the way things were originally meant to be with the old CBZ back in the good old days. Now this top end pro variant comes with a chunkier front KYB fork which can't go unnoticed, while the lower standard and connected variants get the regular telescopic fork at the fore. Braking setup on all variants includes disc brakes on both wheels. The feature list across the XT 160R4 valve variants comprises full LED lighting, a digital instrumentation cluster, single channel ABS, and a side stand engine cutoff function. The connected variants benefit from an eSIM and works in tandem with your smartphone to send out accident related alerts, security functions, location of the vehicle, turn by turn navigation, and more. Surprisingly, the Pro variant though misses this module. Instead, it gets a basic Bluetooth function that displays call and message alert. The Yamaha FZS version 4 looks like it's been going to the gym and beefed up quite a bit over the last decade. Some might think it's even developed a hunchback looking at that enormous fuel tank. The colors on there are all new including on the wheels and that adds to the premium feel of this particular bike. The reverse LCD display on there is bigger and easier to read than on the version 3 model and you do get Bluetooth connectivity now which will alert you to calls, messages and other notifications but no options for navigation. There's no gear position indicator which I guess is alright but I definitely miss that eco light being on there which always gave me that feeling that I was somehow doing something good for a reason. The FZS V4 also gets a traction control system, which is a bit odd because, well, it doesn't really make all that much power to justify being on there. Alright, so for me, the best parts about the Hero Extreme 160, well, this 4 valve version, well, obviously, first of all, the build quality uh, from switch gear to the actual fit and finish of the overall vehicle, obviously a step up for Hero in this particular segment and also a major, major plus point has to be that 163.2 single cylinder in air cooled engine. Good amount of power and torque as well. Uh, it makes more than what the Yamaha has to offer at this point. It makes around 16.9 PS of max power and around 14.6 Nm of max torque. Very nice and lively out on the road and very easy to manage as well. The Hero engine feels very nice and punchy. The 4 valve model breathes and performs a lot cleaner now, and that's something that some of the extreme models in the past lacked. The riding posture is upright with minimal weight on your palms while the rear set foot pegs adds a touch of sportiness to the mix. The seat cushioning is dense and should be good for longer stints in the saddle. Now the suspension out here, well it's on the stiffer side which goes well with Hero's overall sporty aesthetic. Good for getting a feel of the bike while riding fast and everything is nice and refined until around 75 to 80 kmph in top of fifth gear. Anything over that and it begins to feel out of place really. But when you want to take it easy, things can get a bit uncomfortable because you will feel every small undulation on the road jolt your spine. Having a pillion aboard does help otherwise and you will have to tweak the preload adjustable rear suspension if you're traveling solo. Now the best parts about the Yamaha FZS, well version 4, for me have to be first of all the ride and handling, well the ergonomics of it all because it's very upright, very easy going, uh, not too aggressive and very comfortable. Out on the highway as well, well this riding position should be very comfortable. The engine of course, that bulletproof 149cc uh, single cylinder engine, only air cooled out here and it makes a total of around 12.4 uh, PS of max power and 13.3 Nm of max stock, which is a lot more modest than what uh, the output is on the Hero 4 valve version but then again very easy going nice and decent for the city also it's lighter so handling in the city in traffic well it's a real breeze with this one so the Yamaha is a spacious and very easy bike to ride overall at first well the suspension does appear to be quite firm in this factory setting 
which is great for when you're riding up to a speed of around 80 kmph just like the hero but then again you will get used to it because it does deliver a more comfortable ride over all sorts of surfaces all throughout which is great because well this was always a huge plus point with the earlier models of the FZS the bike does take a wider line to take a complete turn though which is a bit of a bother while snaking past traffic at a signal over the last 10 years both these motorcycles the Yamaha FZS and the Hero 160 have evolved substantially in the last 10 years but then for me with the Yamaha it seems to be more of an aesthetic more than functional aspect because although it is a very comfortable motorcycle to ride well it isn't the most interesting because it still makes a modest amount of power it is very comfortable but just doesn't cut it for me given the 127000 asking price like showroom of course but in this company out here today for me it has to be the hero extreme 160 well the four valve because primarily it offers a lot more in terms of features it is the more interesting motorcycle to ride it is more lively and of course you have three options uh, three trim levels to choose from from the standard to the connected and this top end pro variant but unfortunately this top end pro variant the only downside for me is that it doesn't get the connectivity options that comes with the mid spec variant With that it's a wrap on this week's edition of Overdrive but remember you can stay in touch with the team through our various social media platforms and you can drop in a comment on our YouTube channel as well we'll see you next week until then drive and ride safe